uh, lecture number nine, bringing harmony to the title of my book. Now my book is titled, The Aesthetics of Emotion, colon, Up the Down Staircase of the Mind-Body. My goal here is to bring harmony to the two parts of the title that are separated by this simple colon, but they imply very different kinds of processes. The aesthetics of emotion implies a process of analogy. The question is the following. How does our appreciation of relations between subject matter and style in art or literature inform our understanding of relations between mind and body in emotional experience? So we have subject matter and style in art. We have mind and body in theory of emotion. And we can add to this purpose and design, or what used to be called form or function in applied design work. Now, why do I use the word analogies? Because analogies describe a mapping between two independent structures. Logical implications of one system, system of art, for example, or design, can help us understand the dynamics in another system. In other words, the study of aesthetics can help us understand emotion. The essential idea here is that dynamic relations between subject matter and style in art or literature can inform, help us understand, emotional and adaptive responses in everyday life and provide insights into how affects, feelings and emotions mediate the interaction between mind and body. In other words, relations between subject matter and style in art are relevant to our understanding of adaptation, which is one of the major themes of the book, and emotional experience the complementary theory in the book. We add to this an extension concerning homologies. Now the term homology refers to the existence of shared ancestry between a pair of structures or genes in different species. In the context of this book, emotions in humans are homologous to the reactions of other mammalian creatures that are lower on the phylogenetic scale. This has been an emphasis for nativist or natural kinds approaches to emotions. These scholars remind us that human emotions share qualities in commons with those of other mammals. It's a complex challenge to address homologies because we need to avoid anthropomorphizing in other words, attributing human qualities to animals. The crucial factor for us, as we move up the scale from lower mammals to humans, is the role of language that makes our emotional experiences more complex because they reflect the role of culture and individual experience in, ter in interpreting emotionally meaningful situations. The way I've handled it in the context of my book is to say, well, humans are more sophisticated in language and human situations are more complex than those faced by lower mammals, but we share in common with them three fundamental themes. <clears> the <throat> theme of attachment and loss. In other words, happiness and sadness for us as humans. But attachment and loss occur in both contexts, for lions and for cows and for all manner of animals that appear in Disney films, and humans who are facing refugee status or who find someone lost after all these years. Same kind of theme, just more complex human context. And then, of course, we have the second theme of assertion 
and self-preservation, the fight or flight theme, which is associated with fear and anger. And animals experience fear and anger just as humans experience fear and anger. It's just that the human context is more sophisticated, more complex, more diverse, unfolds over time historically. But that has the same kind of themes appear as we go from Bible times, pre-Bible times, to our current era. And finally, the theme of absorption or attraction and repulsion, having to do with interest and disgust. Because interest is something that people will attribute to their cats, playing with a ball of yarn, or a dog chasing or turning anything into a play object that will make you fetch. They're absorbed. We are absorbed in paintings, but we're absorbed. They're absorbed. And disgust is the paradigm of the rejection of the food that can be dangerous for us, whether it's in animals or, or children. And then it becomes more complex, as disgust can be discussed with reference to another social group in a political context. What's my point? In homologies, we find continuity across the species, and I'm arguing that there are certain fundamental situational themes that are shared, that are tied to emotions that are shared. But in humans, the meaning is more sophisticated, but the paradigm is there. To what extent the language and complexity of social situations transform these basic emotional reactions? It's a challenge for, schol for scholars. Now, I switch over to the other side of the colon, the moving up and down the staircase of the mind-body. And this is related to metaphorical processes, in a sense. What do I mean? Well, how does this staircase image inform our understanding of everyday and separately aesthetic experiences? It, this is about metaphors. Metaphor accounts for expressive processes that shape both emotional and aesthetic experience. The word expressive is pivotal. And this is where our hierarchies come into play. Hierarchy being a central theme of the book. Metaphors pertain to a bottom-up hierarchy. In this hierarchy, as I stated in the different lectures, the hierarchy is always more concrete at the bottom and more abstract at the top. So a metaphor, such as life as a journey, results from intuiting deeper resemblances in the midst of surface differences between the target, life, and the source, a journey. There's something about the concept of journey as a descriptor that colors our understanding of life. Life is a river. Life is like moving through rapids. Something about the river and the rapids and the journey gives us a deeper understanding, an experiential understanding of the meaning of life. The target term, life, is always more abstract than the source term which is established conditions for what we call a dynamic asymmetry. There's something about this concreteness that gives it power, that gives it impact to color the more abstract term. The concrete term energizes and modifies the more abstract one. Metaphorical effects are always bottom up. Metaphors shape our experiences in spontaneous ways and we are not consciously aware of this process, but only the overall effect. In other words, we cannot experience a metaphor in the moment and understand the underlying process at one and the same time. Because when we experience a metaphor, we're on the inside. And when we understand the logic, so to speak, of a metaphor, we're on the outside. We can be in both places at once. Consider in the context of aesthetics. How do metaphors work here? What is a bottom-up effect here? In this model, the bottom-up effect of a painting, an artwork, 
can create a kind of evocative atmosphere within which the subject matter is experienced. Let me explain, and I will show you a couple examples of paintings in which this is demonstrated. Remember, at the top end, the more abstract end, we have the subject matter of the work, the meaning of the work. At the bottom end, we have the visual or auditory style in the context of poetry, painting, depends on the medium, and the relations between the abstract meaning and the concrete style, see, always take place in an aesthetic context. We know we're looking at art or reading a poem or reading a novel. We expect relations between the two, and they can be seen as complementary. As the viewer or the reader tries to grasp the meaning of the work while moving through the medium, the structure of the medium can shape our experience. And we can enter into the work to greater degrees or lesser degrees and build a bridge between itself and our own feelings as a function of the atmosphere that's created around it. The atmosphere of the experience of the aesthetic event. Now we can be more or less familiar with the story, we can be more or less familiar with the iconography and the external references, but this concrete style of the painting, how the image is created, whether it's hard edged or soft edge, something we've discussed in a previous lecture. The more it's soft edge, the more it's vague, the more we enter it, the more we try to interpret it, the more absorbed we are, the more the atmosphere is there for us to experience the subject matter. It's a bottom-up process. It shapes our experience of the subject matter. It can resonate with the subject matter. Now, this can happen unconsciously and automatically below the threshold of awareness. An important point should be made here. In the 21st century, Impressionist painting of the 1870s in France, 1880s in France, demands a lot of money, is seen as a very special kind of style that's expressive. We look at it in museums and are moved by it. But the Parisians who first saw it rejected it because they just saw it as a sketch. They wanted precision. So just because you have a particular kind of style does not mean that you will automatically have an experience. You have to be able to understand the style. You have to be prepared to enter into the episode for this bottom-up effect to occur, for this atmosphere to take you over. And then we have to think about avant-garde art. In avant-garde art, there's a counterpoint. On purpose, there's a discordance between the loud colors, the sharp edges, and the subject matter of the work facing off against each other. This pushes us away. This wakes us up. This can be part of the goal of the artist. The artist works with the form of the work and the subject matter of the work to create experiences that are absorbing and push us or can push us away. But this is a metaphorical experiential process. The style provides a context within which the experience occurs. Let's move over to the domain of emotion. Now, as, I, as I've explained, Emotions sit on appetites and needs that work homeostatically. And above that we have affects, which are dimensions of bodily response and pain and pleasure or excitement that can be conditioned, that can feel, work according to an opponent process dynamic. On top of that we have feelings that can feel down into those bodily states and experience them or be the result of logic. And at the top we have emotions. Feelings filled with meanings related to the self that bring the body to life. These changes in bodily states, which are below the threshold of perception, can tacitly or unconsciously modify our experiences of situations, just like the style of the artwork can provide a context or modify our experience of the subject matter of the work. 
in the context of everyday life, liquors or drugs or hormonal fluctuations can affect the way we see the world without our being aware of it. So the changes in the body are like the style of the painting or the poem that the artist or poet or novelist or dramatist manipulate, providing a context for experience, a whole experience, whether it's in art or whether it's in everyday life. We consciously are aware of the, of the final product, the way we see the world in everyday life or in art. This is a feed-forward process. According to emotional phase theory, our interpretations of meaningful situations reawaken past episodic memories along with the bodily sensations and qualities that occurred in the earlier episodes. It's a bottom-up shaping of experience. Psychodynamic psychologists underscored the importance of situations and our interpretations of them for triggering these long lost memories and past reactions in a rapid and unconscious way that feed up and shave our overall experience. That's why emotions are like liberated instincts. They're not automatic responses to narrow events, stimuli that will scare the bird or the, or the dog but rather situations that are meaningful that we interpret, like the situations in artworks or poems or movies that bring back memories, that reawaken bodily reactions, that automatically feed forward and create a unified experience in daily life or in aesthetics. That's why they're holistic, because they are shaped by bodily responses that work with meanings to embed us on the inside of lived experiences. And that's in a sense in which they're bottom up. They shape the form of the experience, just like the style of the painting shapes the form of our encounters in the museum. And that's why both with paintings and poems and novels and everyday life experiences, phenomenological psychologists have reminded us that time changes, closes in, opens up in space, faster, slower, causality can break down, we can feel on the outside, forced on the outside, or drawn to the inside of the event. Distortion is the hallmark of emotional experience and aesthetic experience. In other words, when we're moved by a situation or we're moved by an artwork, we're drawn in we have a whole unified experience that has these properties of time and shape. The opposite can occur for us in the top-down context, where in our attempts to adjust the situations, to adapt to situations, to see things in a realistic way, to see paintings in a realistic way, we inhibit our emotions top-down. We sit on them. We don't permit ourselves to have them. It's in that sense that the realism of painting and the realism of practical everyday life are the same. The function of the style of the painting is to help us read what it's about. We don't have to have feelings. We just have to read the subject matter. In everyday life, the function of the body is to help us respond in a practical way to challenges and realize our goals, keep the emotions out of it, solve the problems first. So in the end, the aesthetics of emotion and up the down staircase of the mind-body help us move to aesthetics to see how can our understanding of the arts inform our understanding of emotions in everyday life. And the hierarchy of up the down staircase, the bottom up metaphor that shapes our whole experience spontaneously, automatically, provides a context both for aesthetics and everyday life. And in the contrast to it, the pragmatics of everyday life that does not want emotion because it can get in the way of our understanding the film. If we're a theater film critic or theater critic, Understanding what the, the painting is about, is it good or is it bad? Don't let emotion get in the way. These are complementary processes. The bottom-up spontaneity and the top-down inhibitory are the two phases of spontaneous whole experience in life 
finding meaning in life and in art, and on the other hand, following the Darwinian path to solving our needs and adapting to our worlds. Thank you for listening to the lecture.